we light the first candle in honor of the, of the Lakota spirituality. When one sits in the hoop of the people, one must be responsible because all of creation is related. And the hurt of one is the hurt of all. And the honor of one is the honor of all. And whatever we do affects everything in the universe. We light the second candle to honor Buddhism. Because all existence is founded upon the ever-present state of union, everything already exists in a state of tranquility. However, this state of tranquility is masked from us by our assumption that there is a separation, that there is a problem. We light the third candle to honor Sikhism. Even as the scent dwells within the flower, so God resides always within your heart. We light the fourth candle to honor Islam. Our bread and water are of one table. The progeny of Adam are as a single soul. We light the fifth candle to honor Judaism. Actually, we are all divine light. We sparkle, we glow, but when fear arrives, it's like water on fire, quenches our heart's warmth. We light the sixth candle to honor Hinduism. When we are afraid of something or someone, it is because we do not feel that particular person or thing is a part of us. When we have established conscience, conscious oneness with the absolute, with the infinite vast, then everything there is part of us. And how can we be afraid of ourselves? We light the final candle to honor Christianity. Your life and my life flow into each other as wave flows into wave. Unless there is peace and joy and freedom for you, there can be no real peace or joy or freedom for me. Our reading today comes from a quote from Swami Prasnapad. In nature, action and reaction are continuous. Everything is connected to everything else. No one part, nothing is isolated. Everything is linked and to everything else and interdependent. Everywhere, everything is connected to everything else. Each question receives the correct answer. So I invite you now to just take these words within for a moment of contemplation. So from the center of divine consciousness, I know spirit is. I know that divine mother, divine father is. I know that myself and everyone here is a part and one with spirit. And from this oneness, I know that we are uplifted, that we are supported, and that we are loved. And I simply relax into this divine truth and experience. And so it is. Our topic for, um, well, first of all, I do want to just say that I'm real glad to be home. I, I went to Los Angeles first for a, uh, a retreat with all the ministerial students from around the country and a couple of other countries. And then I went to Chicago for another conference, and then I came home and slept for three days. <laughs> it was a long haul without, without pausing, so uh, I missed you all. I missed you. Our theme for October is cherishing the human family, and the shared value that we're focusing on is unity. Unity, oneness, etc. I want to focus on unity today because... I've been seeing something in myself and in the students in Los Angeles and in my family and friends and all around me. And, and what I see is a sense, an idea, a sense that somehow we're separate. We're separate from the good stuff. 
in life. You know, I see a lot of people feeling like they are not part of the human family, that they're all by themselves, that they're overwhelmed, and that they're alone. There's a sense of not having enough, not being enough, not having enough time or money or love or good or whatever it is. A fear that we're going to run out of the things that make life pleasant, a fear that we're doing life all by ourselves and that there are powers out there that are somehow arrayed to make it more difficult. That is an illusion caused by our own belief that we're separate somehow from the grace and the abundance and the peace of the universe, from the, from the very source of life itself, that, that all these things that all these mystics say in the candle lighting readings and, and what the Swami says in our reading are not true, are not true. And, um, and our founder, Ernest Holmes, sort of told us about that. He said, if we think of ourselves as being separated from the universe, we shall be limited by this thought. We shall be limited by this thought. For it is, a sep uh, it is a belief in separation from the divine that binds us and limits us. It's that feeling of separation that gives rise, I think, in my opinion, to what we see in the news. And I'm using air quotes because news is all about the not-so-good stuff, right? And they call it news because it's rare. It is not the lifeblood of what's going on around us. It is not what happens in most places most of the time. But the news would have us believe that the world is a treacherous place. It's dangerous, and life is a difficult race, and it's getting more difficult, and there's all sorts of stuff going on. But I think what's in the news stems in part from that belief that life is a difficult race and we're doing it all alone and that there are powers arrayed against us and that, and that we're separate and that we're unworthy and that we don't have enough. You know, for most of us, thank goodness, when those feelings crop up, our reaction to them is not something that will get us on the news. It's a really good thing, right? <laughs> But those feelings and those ideas still mess with us. They still make us feel... Uh, what, incapable of, of rising to whatever life, whatever challenge life is, is putting in front of us. It, they still color everything that we experience and, and they become or can become what we look from. They can become our perspective, those, those ideas that we're alone, that we're limited, that somehow there isn't enough. And when that becomes our perspective, that's, it. that's all we see. When that is what we're looking from, that's all we see out there. That's the one thing that, that you know, among the many that quantum physics tells us is that we don't believe it when we see it. We see it when we believe it. So if our perspective is, ooh, life is rough, then guess what? It will be. It will be. It'll be difficult. We look at our bank accounts and say, there's not enough. We look at our relationships and say, that's not enough. We look in the mirror and say, I'm not enough. You know, we have this general mm, lack of ease and worry and constriction. And we may not even be conscious that we're doing that. We may not even be conscious that we're looking at our life and saying, this isn't enough but it's still restricting us. And so what I want to talk about today is, is how we heal that idea. What we can do to make ourselves see the truth instead of that illusion that the news tries to tell us is reality. And I want to say, first of all, this is not a new idea. It's not, it doesn't belong to us. About a thousand years ago, the poet Rumi reminded us you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the ocean in a drop. And about 2,000 years ago, Marcus Aurelius wrote, all things are linked with one another, and this oneness is sacred. There's nothing that's not interconnected with everything else. For things are interdependent, and they combine 
to form the universal order. There is only one universe made up of all things and one creator who pervades them, and all truth is one. There is only one path of perfection for all beings who share the same mind. I could give you quotes from even farther back and even more recent, but you get the point. And our founder, Ernest Holmes, really got the point. He, he read all these mystics and philosophers and thought long and hard about it. And, and then he wrote something really profound that we picked up in a practitioner class whenever the last time we met was. <laughs> Feels like a month, but it's only been a week or so. He said, you know, th there's a process in healing, not a process of healing. There's a process in healing, healing everything, including this feeling of scarcity or lack or not enoughness. And that process is the uncovering of the divine that resides within us. That process is the, the deep understanding that we're not a drop in the ocean. We are the ocean in a drop. It's the, that understanding. And so after, you know, many more words, because Holmes never said anything really concisely. <laughs> Love his writings, but they're repetitive. He said, when we learn to trust the universe, we shall be happy, prosperous, and well. And then he went on to say, there are principles that support our trust in the universe. You know, there's a principle of light. There is no principle of dark. There's a principle of truth, not of untruth. There's a principle of love, not fear. There's a principle of health, not disease, of abundance, not poverty, of life, not death. The principles are the things that, that are the nature of the universe. The nature of the universe is the nature of principle, darkness is the absence of light, but the principle is light. Lack is the absence of abundance. Fear is the absence of love, but love is the principle. So when we can see that, instead of this perception that we sometimes get that light is absent, that abundance is absent, that love is absent, it's because we look from the wrong perspective. We look from this perspective that there's a lack somewhere in our lives that and we focus on the lack of these things instead of their constant presence if they're principal they're here all the time right and what we look from determines our experience this is what dr holmes was speaking of when he said change your thinking and your life will change he was telling us to change what we think about what we focus on what we, what we use as the lens through which we view life. And when we change what we focus on, then our life experience changes. When we start to focus on what's within ourselves, when we start to focus on the ocean that we are, instead of the drop, the, this universal power that lives as us and in us and through us, then we start to experience the prosperity and the happiness and the wellness that Holmes was talking about. Jesus said it too, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all else shall be given unto you. And shortly thereafter he said the kingdom of heaven is not out there and not over there. It is within you. So, you know, finding that heaven is why we contemplate and meditate and study and come together in community and pray and pay attention to what we're thinking. Because we're trying to find and focus on that place within us that is heaven. And when we do that, when we focus on that, then heaven becomes our manifest reality. We look around and see good and beauty and joy and we look in the mirror and see the ocean in that drop looking back at us, right? And of course, 
you know, that's what I prefer to focus on, but you are absolutely at liberty to focus on hell, should that be what you desire to experience. <laughs> we are always a choice, right? So when we choose heaven, we kind of find a navigation system. When we do the things that make us arrive at that place of heaven within us, what we've arrived at is a navigation system for getting through the world with grace and with joy. And everything else is given to us when we have that, right? When we don't lose our joy, when we don't lose our connection with the grace of the universe, when we don't fall into the misunderstanding that somehow we're not the ocean and the drop, then what we need comes to us. We know exactly how to get it. We know exactly where to go. We know how to approach someone else with love so that love comes back to us. We understand that, those things. It's a navigation system that comes from within out rather than outside in. And, and there's a little book that was suggested for this month. It's called The Principle of Oneness. It's by Russell Anthony Gibbs. And in, in this book, I, I don't know who he is, but he's pretty good. Gibbs writes this. He says, Our connections to the oneness of the universe are both with physical and atomic matter and non-physical spiritual energy. In other words, it's all matter or energy or anything else. It's all this thing we call God. We interact with all of it. And he uses as an example the brain. Do we interact with our brains? Oh, boy. Sometimes too much, right? <laughs> But we also interact with consciousness, which is that bigger, larger thing that the brain, that uses the brain to um, cause imagination and, and memory and all those other wonderful characteristics that we humans have. But the physical part of us has not evolved as, fa as fast as the consciousness part. I'm sure you've noticed that. And so it's very easy for us to fall into the delusion that everything is going to hell in a handbasket because our brain is, is the processor that we use first showed up in the world in a little creature about that big that is our earliest known ancestor. And, and it, you know, it was prey for a lot of other things. And so it was good for that creature to be very, very aware of what danger there might be around us because their whole point was to stay alive so they could transmit their genes to the next generation. That was the level of consciousness at that point. But you know what, that was 145 million years ago. It's a long time ago. Our consciousness has evolved way beyond that. Way, way, way beyond that. But there's still this early part of our brain that says, danger, danger, Will Robinson, danger, danger. <laughs> and we flip out, right? Isn't it time to acknowledge that the consciousness, that, that which is larger and more powerful and unlimited, is sophisticated enough to know truth from illusion? You know, I, I think that if the brain saw the rope and went, ah, snake, the consciousness is still potent enough to say, just a rope, just a rope, don't worry about it, right? When we realize that the brain will always do its thing, it will always be spewing out a million little thoughts, most of which are nonsense, and it will be always be looking for danger, then we can let it do its thing without letting that totally limit and restrict our consciousness, which is unlimited and enormous, and that has imagination and memory and will and all those other capacities. It has the capacity to launch itself out into deep space. You know, we can look at a photo of deep space from one of those amazing, what do you call them? Telescopes. Telescopes, thank you. <laughs> Just lost the word altogether. <laughs> we can think about a picture of deep space and realize that we're nestled right in the center of that. You know? We can, we can look at, at a picture of an electron microscope and say, wow, look at all those little tiny subatomic particles, and there are how many billions and trillions and quadrillions of those in my body? We can see that, that reality sometimes 
is not, reality with a small r, is not what's really going on. It appears to be the absence of something bigger and deeper, something real. We can range every, anywhere we want with our consciousness. It has evolved way beyond the physical. So why wouldn't we choose to use the advanced tool instead of the stone axe? Do you know what I mean? That's my suggestion. Is let's rely on the more powerful thing instead of the less powerful. You know, I think the brain does what, what it does and we believe it because it's our habit. I'm here to urge us instead to pick up the tools that we, we have been received from all of these spiritual masters, the ones that put us into the serious practice of truth, beginning with the truth that we are all, always, and forever one with that which, which we call spirit. We're not drops in the ocean. We're oh, the ocean in each drop, the whole ocean. And when we focus on that, rather than on what the news says, life gets much more beautiful. When we focus on the light, the darkness disappears. When we focus on the love, the fear disappears. When we focus on abundance, we feel more prosperous. And when we put all those things together, we are happy, prosperous, and well, which is just what Ernest Holmes told us would happen. True in our individual lives, true in the life of this community, true in the world, because it's what you and I do that creates our world. Did you all know Rumi had a teacher? Many people don't know that. Rumi wrote a lot of poems about his teacher. And the teacher's name was Shams of Tabriz. And he wrote this, he said, the universe is one being. Everything and everyone is interconnected. Whether we're aware of it or not, we are always in a silent conversation. The words that come out of our mouths do not vanish, but are perpetually stored in infinite space, and they will come back to us in due time. One man's pain will hurt us all. One man's joy will make everyone smile. So the more we create joy in our own lives, and in our community, and in our town, and our state, and our world. The more we create abundance in our lives, and in our spiritual community, and everywhere we are, the more we love and spread love with all that we do, the more joy and love and abundance show up in the world. You know, and when we do it together, whew, it's very powerful stuff. It's very powerful when we come together to remind ourselves and each other that we're the ocean not to drop, everything changes. So I'd like to invite you to just be clear on what you focus on in your life. Look at what you focus on in your thoughts. When you think about yourself, when you look in the mirror, and if you're thinking, not enough, flip that around and think, I am the ocean in this drop called me. Think about the spiritual community. And think about it as a place that is vibrant and supportive and reaching out into the community and abundant and prosperous and thriving. You know, we've been here for 73 years. Amazing, huh? Doing what we do for 73 years. When you think about your world, think about it as a place of happiness and abundance and wellness and joy instead of a world that's frightening and that you're all alone in. Let's do this. We can do it. We all start using that highly evolved, amazing, expansive consciousness more than we use the blunt tool of our brains when we all start just opening our hearts and living from love instead of fear, everything will change. Everything will change. Let's change our lives. Let's change our community. Let's change our world. 
We can do this.